Okay, uh, we'll get started class. So we have been talking about uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for optimality. No, we haven't been talking about that. Today we are going to talk about that. Necessary and sufficient conditions for optimality. So what we have done so far, we have understood some of the prerequisites from linear algebra and calculus. And we have understood the concept of global and local minima. So in global minima, you are at the minimum in the entire space. Whereas in a local minimum, what you're doing is if you're standing at a local minimum point, you look around on all the sides. And as long as you are minimum among all the other points around you, then, then you are good. Okay, so that's the local minimum. Now, the question is on a computer, you see a number, a vector or something like that, and you want to know whether you are standing at a local minimum or a global minimum or a uh, local maximum or a global maximum, how do you provide that certificate, okay? And that's the goal for today's class. We will try to come up with certificates which allows us to conclude that the point that the computer is telling us is indeed a local minimum, global minimum or not, or possibly a candidate for a local or a global minimum. So, so that's what we are going to do today. Oh, uh, let me tell you what the problem is. We want to minimize. The problem is I want to minimize a function f of x. x is in Rn. f is smooth, which means it's differentiable. All we need is twice differentiability, but let's assume that it's infinitely differentiable. We don't want to get into uh, funny mathematics here. We just want to keep our life simple. So I want to solve this problem. I want to minimize a function f, a smooth function f, over the entire space Rn. One thing to keep in mind is in simpler problems, let's say in an embedded microcontroller, this Rn is just a one-dimensional or two-dimensional space. In a more complicated problem, for instance, an autonomous car, this Rn could be five or 10-dimensional space. And if you're running machine learning algorithms over large number of servers, this Rn could be a billion-dimensional space, okay? So you could go all the way from one or two-dimensional in a small microcontroller like a thermostat to a billion-dimensional space when you are doing the optimization over 500 servers uh, in, in parallel, okay? I don't know how many of you have used Ohio Supercomputing Center, but we have a supercomputer somewhere on the campus, and uh, it has a lot of servers, and you can run billion-dimensional optimization problems there. Okay, so this is the problem, and I'm going to define two quantities. One is the optimal solution. which is x star, and the way to denote it is, it is arg min x in Rn f of x, arg min, okay, argument of minimum. It's the point at which the minimum is achieved, and the second term is optimal value, which is f of x star. Okay, I have a smooth function, I want to minimize it. I'm defining two quantities, one is optimal solution, it's a vector, it's a vector, and it is the point at which the minimum is achieved. And the second one is a scalar, which is the optimal value of the function, or rather value of the function at the optimal point. 
Okay. Now here is the first result. So necessary condition. X star is local minimum if X star is a local minimum then the first derivative of F at X star is 0 the second derivative of F at X star is positive semi-definite If I am at a local minimum, the first derivative of the function must vanish and the second derivative of the function must be positive semi-definite. Okay, so this is known as first order necessary condition for optimality and the second one is second order necessary condition for optimality. First order because you are taking the first derivative, second order because you are taking the second derivative here. Let us think about implications of that particular result. So I am I'm, I'm running some optimization on a computer uh, and I get a point x star and at that point my first derivative is not equal to 0. My first derivative is uh, 520. What does that mean? So I have a point and the first derivative is non-zero. What does that mean about that point? It's not at a place where it's a local minimum. It is a slope. Where right. So it's it's not at we are not at a local minimum, right? So so this condition gives you a way to certify whether a point is not a local minimum. Okay. So if I look at the first derivative, if it is non-zero, or if I look at the second derivative, and it is uh, not a positive semi-definite matrix, so it could have some negative eigenvalues. This is always going to be a symmetric matrix, right? But it could have some negative eigenvalues. If it, is, if it has negative eigenvalues, then it means that you are not sitting at a local minimum, okay? So you need to run your optimization more. Now let's consider the other case. I get a point x star, the first derivative is zero, and the second derivative is positive semi-definite. What does that mean? What does that mean? So just look at the, the, the statement. So if x star is local minimum, then something happens, right? All I'm saying is this something is happening in the code. What does that tell us about x star? Before it and after it have changed the direction. Like it could be from right. negative or negative or positive. Okay. That's if it equals zero. That's the first one. And what about the second one? That says that you change from what is negative to a positive. Positive. Okay. So you're looking at one dimension, but I'm talking about maybe a billion dimensional case, right? So so if you have the first derivative is 0 and the second derivative is positive semi-definite, then it is a candidate optimal solution, but not an optimal solution. It's a candidate, okay? I, I, it could be a solution, it may not be a solution, I don't know, right? So that's what necessary condition does. If it is not optimal, 
it will give you a certificate that it is not optimal. If it is potentially optimal, it will tell you that, okay, there is a possibility that it is optimal, but it may not be optimal. Okay, so those are known as necessary conditions for optimality. We'll go over the proof in, uh, in a bit, but let's look at the necessary and sufficient conditions. If x bar is such that gradient of f of x bar equals to 0, the second derivative of f at x bar is strictly positive definite. So all eigenvalues are strictly positive. Then x bar is a local minimum. Okay. So I'm running a code in MATLAB and I find a point at which the first derivative is zero and the second derivative is strictly positive definite matrix. What does that mean? What does that statement say? That point, that point is a local minimum, okay? So this gives us a certificate to say with certainty that look, at this point, the first derivative is equal to zero, the second derivative is strictly positive definite, this point is a local minimum, okay? So sufficient condition is stronger. Necessary condition is weaker. This is positive semi-definite. This is positive definite, okay? So sufficient condition is stronger. There's another sufficient condition, which is the convex case. So F is convex. then, well, x star is global minimum if and only if, if and, well, I'm using if, if and only if gradient of f of x star is equal to zero. Yes. This is just when x is convex, right? That's right. If f is monotonically increasing or decreasing, you still have a minimum, you won't find it in this If f is increasing or decreasing? Monotonically increasing or decreasing. Sorry, can you say that again? Monotonically increasing or decreasing. I'll just increase or just decrease. So when you talk about monotonically increasing, you have to talk about which direction, because now we are talking about n-dimensional space. So if I have a, let's consider one dimension function and let's consider fx equal to x. It's a monotonically increasing function, but the minimum is minus infinity. Well, then it's not a minimum anymore. Right, but in that problem, the minimum doesn't exist. So the solving that problem is futile because there is no minimum in that problem, right? Yeah. So we are implicitly assuming that there is a minimum in the problem. It's not minus infinity or not a number or one over zero or anything of that sort. There is a finite value. Okay. So in the case of convex function, just checking the gradient is good enough. You don't have to look at second derivative at all. Just checking the gradient that the gradient is zero gives you the guarantee that x star is a global minimum. You don't have to do, you don't have to run the algorithm any further. And that's the reason why convex optimization is so famous. And people would like to solve convex problem because 
the guarantee is extremely easy to get. And this is a guarantee for global minimum, okay? I want to emphasize that this is a guarantee for global minimum, whereas here, the guarantee is only for a local minimum. You have to come up with more complicated argument to argue that whatever point you have found is a global minimum or not. Okay, but in the case of convex function, that, that problem doesn't arise. You, you are always at a global minimum if the derivative vanishes. Let's look at some examples. A any question on these two sufficient conditions? Or the necessary condition? Uh, we'll get to the proof in a bit. I just want to write the statement. But the, the statement here is, if you have a convex function, uh, x star being global minimum is equivalent to the gradient of f at x star being equal to 0. Okay? We'll get into the proof in a, in a few minutes. Yes, please. Uh, why not? Let's let's look at some example. Okay. So I want to minimize. Let's look at some example. Okay. 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 let so this is the claim, x star is a local minimum. Uh, let's do the first derivative. So gradient of f at x star, that's equal to 0. What's the second derivative of f at x star? 2. So this is the case where first derivative is 0, but the second derivative is non-zero. All right, so does this satisfy the necessary conditions for optimality? Yes, it does, right? Does it satisfy the sufficient conditions for optimality? Yes, it does. Is it the convex case? Yes, it is, right? So this example is very easy because all the conditions are satisfied and we know from experience that x star equal to zero is the optimal solution. Let's look at x cubed now. What is an optimal solution for minimizing x cube? It, there, there is no optimal solution here, right? Because this goes all the way to minus infinity. So there is no optimal solution. Let's, for the argument's sake, say that x star here, x star equals to 0, which is it satisfies, I mean, uh, I'm just claiming that, hey, look, look at this optimization problem. I'm claiming that x star equals to zero is an optimal solution. Let's compute the first derivative. And it's equal to zero. Let's compute the second derivative. And that's also equal to zero. So x star equals to zero satisfies the necessary conditions for optimality but we know from experience that it's not optimal, okay? So what this tells us is you could have points in the space when you're solving an optimization problem, you can have points in the space which satisfies the necessary conditions for optimality, but that means nothing, okay? It means, it literally means nothing because uh, it could be a candidate solution, but it could not be, it may not be a solution at all. And in this case, it is not a solution at all, even though it satisfies the necessary conditions for optimality. Another thing you will notice, it, it doesn't satisfy the sufficient conditions for optimality because the second derivative is not strictly positive. So we cannot really apply this particular result there because it doesn't satisfy the hypothesis. Uh, it's not a convex function, so I really cannot apply this particular result as well. So in this case, 
the necessary conditions are satisfied, but x star equals to zero is not optimal. Not optimal. Let's look at the third example. I want to minimize x raised to 4. What is an optimal, what, what, what's a candidate for optimal solution here? 0. What's the first derivative and second derivative? 0. Okay. So I, I, I came up with another problem. The necessary conditions are satisfied. The first sufficient condition is not satisfied because the second derivative is not strictly greater than zero. So I cannot really use this result because the hypothesis is not satisfied in that particular problem. But I can use this result because I know that x raised to 4 is convex. Why is it convex? Because the second derivative is non-negative, right? So the function f is convex. So x star is a global minimum if and only if gradient of fx star equals to 0. I know that in this case, gradient of fx star is equal to 0. So I can use this sufficient condition or necessary and sufficient condition to conclude that x star equals to 0 is an optimal solution here. OK, any questions so far? Uh, I'm trying to understand what is the difference here. Now, the case when you have del square f of x star is equal to 0, if you look at it in like n is equal to 1 dimension, it's right. the case where it's a flat line there, right? So uh, is equal to zero, yes. It's a flat line. It's locally a flat line. Yeah. So in the case of uh, f of x bar greater than zero, you basically are sure that that point is the point. Has a curvature. Yeah. It has a positive curvature. So that is the point. That's right. But in that case, that there are multiple points that could That's be. right. So that is the difference between. That's the exactly point. right. Okay. Yeah. Now, it also says that this is for convex case. Right. And in convex case, the requirement is that del square s of x greater than or equal to zero. Correct. So at all x. At all x. Yeah. That is only requiring it at x star. Okay. Okay. And f being convex means that this holds for all x. It holds at x star. It holds on this side of x star. It holds on that side of x star. Right. So that's okay. the Correct. Correct. One more question. In, yes, in the previous lecture you said that <coughs> in convex to find out that a function is actually convex, we need to visually inspect it. That is the easiest way to do it. Uh, when it's not differentiable. Yeah. Right. But if it is in, okay, so you're saying if it's differentiable then in high dimension. Yeah, if it is differentiable you look at the second derivative and you somehow conclude that it is convex. Yeah. Yeah, but in very high dimensional, uh, so you know in most situations, in most day-to-day -day situations, you construct this function f, okay? So you kind of know whether it's convex or not convex because that's by construction. Uh, it's very rare, of course in some cases it is natural to construct a function that is non-convex, okay? So in those cases you get into a lot of trouble. Uh, I was in one signal processing seminar where the function f looked something like this. Now I don't know why, uh, I mean under what situations the objective function was like this, but it had two minimum, two local minimum. But as you can see, both the local minimums are actually global minimum. But this function is neither convex nor concave nor has any other cool properties. It's not monotonic. But in this case, all local minimum are actually global minimum. So it doesn't really matter where you are. As long as you converse to one of these local minimum, you are good. Um, many people are thinking about neural networks and their argument is all local minimum are approximately global minimum. 
Okay, so it's just a, uh, I'm guessing some people have proved some results like that. I haven't really read the literature very well, but, uh, but there is some emerging theory which is saying that in neural networks, all local minimum are approximately global minimum. So the local minimums are essentially, in this one billion dimensional space, the function is essentially looking like this. So, you know, all local minimums are approximately global. Any other question? Okay. So necessary conditions allow us, uh, gives us a certificate to say that this point is not a local minimum. The sufficient conditions allows us to say that this point is a local minimum, okay? And of course, in the convex case, uh, it's very easy to check whether something is a global minimum or not by just checking the first derivative. Okay. Let's look into the, let's, let's talk about the proof of this, these results. Uh, I want to draw a Venn diagram. So this is my entire space Rn. These are the points that satisfy the necessary conditions for optimality. These are the points that are actually optimal. And these are the points that satisfy the sufficient conditions for optimality. Okay, this is just a Venn diagram to show what's the relationship between these conditions are. And we can come up with examples, actually the three examples are right there, where a point is in one of the diagram, but it's not there in the other one. So let's go over it. Let's look at the third example. It doesn't satisfy the sufficient conditions for optimality, but it is globally optimal. Okay, let's look at the second one. It satisfies the necessary condition for optimality, but there is no optimal solution. And let's look at the first one. It actually satisfies all these conditions. So that point actually lies, in the first case, the point actually lies here. So it satisfies the necessary condition, it is the optimal solution, and it also satisfies sufficient conditions for optimality. So just keep this Venn diagram in mind. And so if you're running an algorithm and you, you come to a point that satisfies the necessary condition, it could be here, it could be here, but it could also be here. And so you cannot be sure whether it's optimal or not. However, when you read papers, uh, people generally claim, hey, look, my algorithm seems to have conversed. The first derivative is zero. It must be the optimal solution. But that's not, that's not true. Okay, you need to have some more structure in the problem to be able to claim that you are at the optimal solution. Okay, don't write such papers, otherwise I'll reject them if I'm the reviewer, okay? You can say it's a candidate optimal solution because it satisfies the first order necessary condition, which means the derivative is equal to zero. You can say that it's a candidate for optimal solution, but you can't really say it is the optimal solution. Okay. Let's look at a proof for necessary condition. So this says x star is a local minimum, then the two conditions should hold. So what that means is I'm standing at x star, this is my x star. I'm looking at direction D, and I'm going to take a small step in this direction. So this is my x star plus alpha D. Alpha is a small step size, and I'm, I'm, I'm sitting at x star, and I'm looking at a specific direction, and I'm going to take a very small step along that particular direction. So that's x star plus alpha D. So this is the point I'm looking at. 
I know that x star is a local minimum. So what I know is f of x star plus alpha d minus f of x star is greater than or equal to 0 for sufficiently small values of alpha. So this is true for all alpha is small and for all d in Rn. Everyone agrees with that statement. Okay, we are at the local minimum, so this statement must be true. Let me divide it by alpha and let the limit alpha go to zero. So remember, alpha, this, this is true for all small values of alpha. So I can take the limit alpha goes to zero. Um, so I'm going to let limit alpha goes to zero. So alpha is a positive number. I'm letting alpha go to zero from the positive side. And I'm looking at x star. What is this equal to? Derivative? Just the derivative? Actually, the implication would go only one way. This is gradient of f at x star transpose d. You can just apply the mean value theorem here. And that's what we are going to get. And this is greater than or equal to 0. And this is true for all d in Rn. <clears throat> OK. So this is true for all d in Rn. What does that mean? It means that gradient of f of x star transpose negative d also has to be greater than or equal to 0. Right? Because it holds for all d. So in particular, I can take negative d as well. And this statement should hold. And when would this be true? When would these two equations simultaneously be true? When this derivative is equal to 0. Only then you can take the inner product with any direction d in Rn and you will end up with a non-negative number when, well, then this must be equal to 0. So this implies gradient of f x star is equal to 0. So that proves the first order necessary conditions for optimality. OK, so we know that the first derivative is equal to 0. Let's start with the same expression and put alpha square here. So I'm going to limit, take alpha goes to 0. What is this equal to? You can use Taylor series expansion. And this is equal to half 
D transpose Okay. What does this imply? What's the last line? So this is a symmetric matrix. Second derivative of f at x star, it's a symmetric matrix. And d transpose matrix times d is not negative for every d in Rn. That's the definition for positive semi-definite matrices. So the second derivative of f is positive semi-definite. Okay, so that proves the second order necessary conditions for optimality. Any questions so far? No? Okay. So now we are convinced that if a point is local minimum, then the first derivative should vanish and the second derivative should be non-negative. Let's look at the sufficient condition for optimality. So, so that's what we need to prove. Or in other words, what we need to prove is that f of x bar plus alpha d minus f of x bar is greater than 0. For all d in Rn and for all alpha small. This is what we need to prove, okay? Let's think about it. Let's go a little bit backward, okay? We'll go a little bit backward, which is, we'll start with this expression and then try and see whether this would be correct or not. This, based on the hypothesis, that would be the situation or not. I'm going to use Taylor series expansion. So what I'm going to get is Okay, so I looked at the Taylor expansion of this difference and I have the first derivative transpose alpha d and I have alpha squared d transpose second derivative d plus some higher order terms that goes to zero much faster than alpha squared. So O of alpha squared means that limit alpha goes to zero, O of alpha square over alpha is equal to zero. That's the small O notation. You may have seen it before, you may not have seen it before, doesn't matter. 
oh, there should be alpha square in the denominator. So, so any term that is small o of alpha square means that if you let alpha go to zero, small o of alpha square over alpha square will go to zero. In particular, this term contains alpha cube, alpha raised to four, alpha raised to five, and so on, all of which will go to zero as you let alpha go to zero. Okay, so the difference is equal to this particular number, I mean this particular value. I know that the first derivative at x bar is equal to zero, so this term will be equal to zero. I don't have to worry about it. So all I'm left with is half alpha, alpha square half B transpose this is what I'm left with this is true for all alpha small and for all D in Rn Okay. So we haven't yet used the hypothesis that the second derivative is strictly positive definite. Now is the time to use it. So let's pick a D that is non-zero Let's pick alpha that is very small. What is this term going to look like? If alpha is very small, then remember that O alpha square over alpha square goes to zero, which means that this term is going to be very, very small, okay? Now if D is non-zero and this is strictly positive definite, what does that mean? This term is going to be a positive number, okay? So I have a positive number plus a negative number, or I mean, not negative number, but a number which could be positive or which could be negative, we don't know. But this number is very, very small. What happens when you add a positive number with a number that is very, very small, but could take positive or negative values? What could the sign of this sum be? It's going to be positive, right? So this is strictly greater than zero for all D non-zero. And in fact, we only care about D being non-zero, right? D equals to zero means you're just sitting at that point, so it doesn't really matter. So this term is strictly greater than zero for every D that is non-zero and for alpha very small. So remember, this is positive. This term is positive, this term is extremely small, negligibly small. So what I'm left with is a positive number, which is exactly what we wanted to prove to begin with. Okay, any question? Uh, when we say alpha small or very small, it means less than one or it means... Like 10 raised to minus six small or 10 raised to minus 10 small. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, so we proved the necessary conditions for optimality, we proved the sufficient condition for optimality. Let's talk about the convex case. So F is convex, X star optimal if and only if gradient of fx star equals to zero. This is actually very easy to prove because remember from the definition of convexity, f of x plus d is greater than or equal to 
f of x star plus d transpose gradient of f of x star. Right? This is the definition of convexity. So function f is convex if and only if it satisfies this condition. Okay, this was the second uh, condition we talked about yesterday. Uh, sorry, on Monday. What is this term? That term is zero, right? Gradient of fx star is equal to zero. So if that is zero, then f of x star plus d is greater than equal to f of x star. This is true for all d in Rn. This is true for all d in Rn. Okay, so if x star is optimal, we know from the first order necessary condition that the gradient of fx star will be equal to zero. So all we have to prove here is the opposite direction, which is if gradient of fx star is zero, then x star is globally optimal. So this goes by the definition, I mean this expression comes from the definition of convex function. I substitute gradient of fx star is equal to zero and I immediately get that gradient of, sorry, the f of x star plus d is greater than or equal to f of x star, and this is true for every d in Rn. So therefore, x star is globally optimal. x star is a global minimum in this case. Any questions so far? Okay, no questions. So what we have done so far is we have come up with certificates for establishing optimality or non-optimality of a point in the space. Now we want to talk about algorithms to get to that point. Okay, so we want to get to a locally optimal solution or a globally optimal solution how do we get to that particular point in an iterative way? And that leads us to the gradient methods. So in gradient methods, what we want to do is, I'm starting at a point x0, I'm starting at an initial condition x0, and I want to take iterative number of, uh, I mean, I want to take some steps iteratively in order to get to a point which satisfies, hopefully, the sufficient conditions for optimality. So I want to come up with xk plus 1 equals to xk plus alpha k dk starting from some initial condition x0, such that eventually we get to a point which is a locally optimal solution. Let's assume for the time being that my step size alpha k is small at every point of time. The only goal then is to get an, a reasonable value of dk so that I'm making progress towards the optimization at every point of time. So let's look at f of xk plus 1. And I'm going to use the first order Taylor series expansion. And I'm going to get plus alpha k Thank <laughs> you. 
okay so everyone is okay with this approximation i'm just assuming my alpha k is small now the question to pose to us is what dk should i pick so the question let me write the question what dk can i pick so that f of xk plus 1 is strictly less than f of xk then it means that we are making progress towards optimization right i want to make my make some progress towards optimizing the 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 function and reasonably intuitively this seems to be a progress because now i'm getting a value which is strictly smaller than the current value and the question is what should the value of dk be any thoughts Sorry, minus of the gradient. So one answer, let me write answer one is, dk should be minus fxk. Oh, I haven't mentioned, but alpha k has to be greater than zero because it's a positive step size. So one answer is I can take negative of the gradient, right? And that's the right answer. If I take negative of the gradient, this becomes norm of gradient square and that's always a positive number as long as you're not at the optimal solution and therefore you will have a negative uh, sign here positive number positive number so you are decreasing that's right so in this case my f of xk plus one equals to f of xk minus alpha k norm of the gradient square. This is the two norm that we are talking about uh, here. Any other possibility that you can think of? Sorry? F of xk minus 1? Oh, dk minus 1. Uh, let's, well, dk has to be a vector. So, so, minus 1 is just a scalar. So, we can't really pick a scalar quantity. It has to be a vector. Any other thoughts? What other value of dk can we pick? Okay. Let's try another answer. So dk equals to minus capital dk times gradient of fxk. And this dk is a positive definite matrix. So this one is a special case where dk is identity matrix. So I pick a positive definite matrix dk, I multiply it by a vector gradient of fxk, I get the value of dk. And if I pick that, Okay, so in this case again, alpha k is positive. This is greater than zero as long as you are at a non-optimal solution. If xk is not optimal, this would be strictly positive. 
So you are always, fxk plus one will be lower than f of xk. for small values of alpha k. So in the next class, we are going to look into different ways of picking alpha k and dk so that uh, we are always minimizing the function and we'll study the convergence property of gradient descent algorithms. Yes? Can you repeat what dk is? Dk is a positive definite matrix and we have unlimited flexibility with picking any positive definite matrix we want. Uh, it is identity in this case but you can take a, pick a non-identity matrix, matrices as long as it's positive definite in this second case. So let's talk about gradient methods and convergence properties in the next class. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>